I'd like to read that our scripture today is from Judges 9, 22 to 56, and I'm reading for the NRSV. The downfall of Abimelech. Abimelech ruled over Israel three years, but God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the lords of Sheshem. The lords of Sheshem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. This happened so that the violence done to the 70 sons of Jeroboam might be avenged and their blood be laid on their brother Abimelech, who killed them, on the lords of Sheshem, who strengthened his hand to kill his brothers. So, out of hostility to him, the lords of Sheshem set ambushes on the mountaintops. They robbed all who passed by them along that way, and it was reported to Abimelech. When Gal, son of Ebed, moved to Session with his kinfolks, the lords of Session put confidence in him. They went out to the field and gathered the grapes from their vineyards, trod them, and celebrated. Then they went into the temple of their god and ate and drank and ridiculed, ridiculed them. Gal, son of Ebed, said, Who is Abimelech? And who, and who are we of Sheshem that we should serve him? Did not the son of Jeroboam and Zebul, his officer, serve the men of Armor, the father of Sheshem? Then should we serve him? If only this people were under my command, I would remove Abimelech. I would say to him, increase your army and come out. When Zebul the real ruler of the city heard the words of Gal, son of Ebed. His anger was kindled. He sent messengers to Abimelech at Aruma, saying, Look, Gal, son of Ebed, and his kinfolks have come to Sheshem, and they are stirring up the city against you. Now, therefore, go out by night, you and the troops that are with you, and lie in wait in the fields. Then early in the morning, as soon as the sun rises, get up, and rush on the city. And when he and the troops that are with him come out against you, you may deal with them as best you can. So Abimelech and all the troops with him got up by night and lay in wait against Sheshem in four companies. When Gal, son of Ebed, went out and stood at the entrance to the gate of the city, Abimelech and the troops with him rose from the ambush and when Gal said, saw them, he said to Zebul, Look, people are coming down from the mountaintops. And Zebul said to him, The shadows on the mountains look like people to you. Gal spoke again and said, Look, people are coming down from Taberez, and one company is coming from the direction of Elon Meonim. And then Zebul said to him, Where is your boast now, you who said, Who is Abimelech that we should serve him? And are not these troops you made, the troops you made light of? Go out now and fight with them. So Gaul went out to the head of the lords of Sheshem and fought with Abimelech. And Abimelech chased him and he fled before him. Many fell wounded up to the entrance of the gate. So Abimelech resided at Aruma and Zebul drove out Gaul and his kinfolks so that they could not live at Sheshem. On the following day, People went out into the fields. When Abimelech was told, he took his troops and divided them into three companies and lay in wait in the fields. When he looked and saw the people coming out of the city, he rose against them and killed them. Abimelech and the company that was with him rushed forward and stood at the entrance of the gate to the city, while the companies rushed on all who were in the fields and killed them. Abimelech fought against the city all day. He took the city and killed the people that were in it. He raised the city and sowed it with salt. When all the lords of the Tower of Sheshem heard of it, they entered the stronghold of the temple of El Bereth. Abimelech was told that all the lords of the Tower of Sheshem were gathered together. So Abimelech went up to Mount Zalem he and all the troops that were with him. Abimelech took, a six, it took an axe in his hand and cut down a bundle of brushwood and took it up and laid it on his shoulder. And then he said to the troops with him, what you have seen me do, do quickly as I have done. 
So every one of the troops cut down a bundle and followed Abimelech, following Abimelech, put it against the stronghold, and they set the stronghold on fire over them so that all of the people of the Tower of Session also died, about a thousand men and women. Then Abimelech went to Thebes and encamped against Thebes and took it. But there was a strong tower within the city and all the men and women and all the lords of the city fled to it and shut themselves in and they went to the roof of the tower. Abimelech came to the tower and fought against it and came near to the entrance of the tower to burn it with fire. But a certain woman threw an upper millstone on Abimelech's head and crushed his skull. Immediately he called out to the young man who carried his armor and said to him, draw your sword and kill me so that people will not say about me, a woman killed him. So the young man thrust him through and he died. When the Israelites saw that Abimelech was dead, they all went home. And thus God repaid Abimelech for the crime he committed against his father in killing his 70 brothers and sisters. And now we are going to hear from Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine, for that reading. Thank you all for Cedar, uh, Cedar Falls for allowing me to spend time with you this Sunday. Um, and I guess I'll thank you in advance for your patience while we uh, work through a difficult uh, uh, Hebrew text, um, not one that gets taught in Sunday school. I think that's a shame because I really like the Hebrew Bible. But, um, but my hope is also that that means that this is a text that will be new for us. And, and if it's not new for us, that we can think about it in some new ways. So um, today we're going to think about the deep, difficult problem, problems that patriarchy causes for the world. And I want to think about these problems as stones. That's the metaphor we're going to keep coming back to. Stones that when we pile them on top of each other, form walls that separate us and fortresses from which we hurt each other. So we look at this through the book of Judges, which uh, Judges broadly tells the story of a budding nation choosing what it will be, who will lead it, how will it engage with others in the world? Will it be a monarchy? How, if at all, will power be shared? How will power be transferred? We see in the last verse of Judges, of the whole book, that the power struggle to settle these issues does not go well. The last verse of the whole book of Judges says, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So this kind of lawlessness and obedience to individual conscience or, or not conscience, right? We, everybody's going their own way without direction or guidance, or, and that's a problem. This is a prescription for how a nation ought to act, but a description of how they often do act. We pick up today uh, in, this, in the middle of this national crisis in chapter nine. Gideon is the greatest of the 15 judges who had served as the political military leader of the Confederation of Tribes that made up Israel during this period. And after his death, the question of who's going to inherit his power arises. And here's the first stone of patriarchy, the first stone it puts in our path. Patriarchy always seeks to consolidate power among men by using inheritance to pass along wealth, privilege, status. And this has part, been part of Western history for ages, that wealth and titles pass down from father to firstborn son. We call this practice primogeniture. We abolished it in the U.S. in 1777. So early on, we said America is not going to look like that, uh, legally at least. But it remained law in England until 1925 that this is how inheritance worked. And though we've officially abolished it here, I think it still remains foundational to economic disparity in the U.S. Today in the U.S., families save more money for their sons to go to college than they do for their daughters. And that results in higher levels of college debt for women, even as women graduate to job, lower paying jobs. In their 30s, this gap continues as parents give more money to their adult sons uh, than to their daughters, actually about twice as much money that parents um, give as gifts 
to sons than to daughters. Men, you, men continue to inherit family businesses at a much higher rate. And about one third of family business owners feel very strongly that such businesses should pass only to men, not to women. So in short, we don't have mandatory gender-based inheritance systems in the US, but in practice, families invest very literally in patriarchy. But back to our story, Gideon had, according to the first pages of uh, part of Judges 9, at least 71 sons. We don't know how many daughters, they're not even counted. And that includes Abimelech, whose mother was a concubine, and he has 70 sons with his wives, the legitimate children. Abimelech understands that his mother's status typically would prevent him from inheriting his father's power. He's an outsider to his own family, the lesser favored child created with a lesser favored woman. And so we see another stone that patriarchy places in, in the path to justice, peace and reconciliation. It awards women's status in the world based on their relationship to men and sexual relationships between men and women determine the social status of their children. And again, we see this sin. I don't think it's too strong to call this a sin in the US. It wasn't until the 1970s that a woman could get credit except through her husband, for example. And you probably know that today women continue to earn less, even for equal work, even with equal qualifications than men, and that this gap is racialized. But you might not know that the significant part of this gap is based on motherhood. Mothers earn 28.4% less than fathers, with single mothers earning even less. But men who are fathers typically earn more money than men who aren't. We call this the motherhood penalty and the fatherhood bonus. We pay mothers less because we see child rearing as a distraction from work. She's not going to be a good employee because she has to take care of children. But we pay fathers more because we think that fatherhood stabilizes a man and makes him a more committed worker, right? So she has children that will distract her from work. He has children that will motivate him to work. That's kind of the, the, the logic such that it is that goes behind this. The result in the U.S. is wild, rampant child poverty. 16% of children in the U.S. Uh, broadly live in poverty, though Iowa is doing a little bit better. It's 12.6% of children in poverty in Iowa. Across the nation, though, children are the age group most likely to be poor. In our story, this less favored child is ambitious. He asks his mother's family to support his bid for power. He explains it to them this way. You can either be ruled over by 70 of my brothers, none of whom are related to you, or by me, your flesh and blood. And they think this is a good idea. They agree that they'll have more power if they rally behind Abimelech, so they provide him with money. And here is another stone that patriarchy sets before us. It consolidates power. It's constantly pushing to narrow who has power. Previously, the judges included Deborah, a woman, that won't be the case if Israel moves to a monarchy where power is transferred from man to man. And so it is today that patriarchy seeks to narrow who has power. And I want to be clear about this. This doesn't mean that poor men or men of color don't also participate in or benefit from patriarchy. It means that as they do, they enter a more dangerous zone because patriarchy is always trying to kick people out. The man who bullies women can be accepted by other men but eventually he's going to have to bully other men too to gain power or retain power or climb up further in power. So Abimelech's maternal relatives are very foolish here if they think that a man who will betray his own brothers won't betray them. Here's what he does with their money. He hires some goons to kill his brothers, each slaughtered upon a stone except one who survives the youngest, who delivers a warning to his half-brother's relatives. He tells them, if you believe that what you did was right, God bless you. But if what you did was wrong, then Abimelech will destroy you and, and Abimelech will be destroyed. So we, here we have two more stones that patriarchy puts in our path. The stone of family violence and the stone of intergenerational, I, I call it an intergenerational curse. And, and literally it's delivered as a, a prophecy here of what will happen in the future, kind of calling down a curse. By this, I mean the rupture of trust caused by family violence that lives on for generations. And we see this too in today's families, that family violence impacts families over generations. You might be surprised to learn that a victim of domestic violence does not in fact 
being a victim of domestic violence does not actually increase your risk of becoming a domestic abuser, but witnessing domestic violence increases the risk of being an abuser and of being a victim. These children don't necessarily do what was done to them as much as they repeat what their parents do to each other. And it's typically what their fathers do to their mothers. And that's what I mean by the intergenerational curse of family violence. I don't use the word curse here to mean something magical or something unbreakable. And I, I want to be clear that if this describes your family or your family history, um, that this is something that we can change, right? This is not inevitable. We don't have to live with this, but we're more likely to live with it and more likely to experience if we live in a culture that's highly patriarchal or if we live in a highly patriarchal family in families where these patriarchal attitudes are more prevalent, domestic violence is more prevalent. Our reading today picks up after these events. Survivors of Abimelech's family begin to plot against him, this usurper, this outsider who's gained power over them, who's so bloodthirsty. A cousin from Gideon's, uh, Gideon's family moves to town and he emerges as a local leader to rival Abimelech. After a harvest feast one night, the wine is flowing freely. Everyone's cursing their crummy king. Maybe you've been to parties like this. And they say, who is Abimelech? Who is Abimelech? Gaul shouts. Why should he be our king? Why should we be his servants? He and his friend Zebul, his kind of his toady, they should be our servants, right? Down with Abimelech. Make me your king, and you'll see what happens to Abimelech then. I'll tell Abimelech, get up an army and come out and fight. Well, he seeks to perpetuate this system of domination. You win or you lose. You're the king or the slave. Second place is just the first loser. He promises not just to remove Abimelech, which the people probably want, but to humiliate him. You just wait and see what happens to him. And then he's drunk. I keep that in my mind. So I, I, get, I have like a real clear image of what this looks like. He says, come out and fight. And you can kind of imagine him there striking at a T pose, you know, making himself look big and strong, yelling at an imaginary Abimelech and, and saying to him, come out, come out and fight me like kids on a playground. And here's another stone. The way that patriarchy sets the rules so that only violence wins. Notice that Gaul doesn't suggest that they forgo the idea of a king in favor of judges. Instead, he only promises to be a stronger, strong man than Abimelech. He's not here to deliver justice. He's here to bring other people into even more power. The mayor of the city, Zebul, is Abimelech's toady. He overhears these drunken threats and he passes the word to Abimelech that he should crush this potential revolt. Zebul suggests this plan of attack that Abimelech's men divide into four columns and hide overnight in the fields around the city. And in the morning, Gaul is waiting outside the city gates. I kind of imagine him kind of like hung over out there, kind of gad flying. He's wheeling and he's dealing, discussing matters of the city. He looks up and he swears he can see the mountains moving. He turns to Zebul and he says, it, it looks like uh, these mountains are moving. And remember, he, he detests Zebul, but he doesn't suspect him of encouraging violence against his own city. And he says, am I hallucinating? Are there men streaming down these mountains? No, says Zebul, just shadows, nothing to be concerned about, just shadows. And here we have another stone of patriarchy, the lies we tell to protect patriarchy, the lies we tell to trap others, the lies we tell in pursuit of violence. The ki this kind of lie is gaslighting, not just telling something, someone something that's untrue, but telling them that they can't even trust their own perceptions. And it's not unique to misogyny, it's not unique to patriarchy, but it's a common tool of patriarchy. Gaul insists, but by now it's too late. Abimelech's forces are on them. He turns accusingly to Zebul, who triumphantly reveals this villainous plan. Now where's that big mouth of yours? Huh? You were talking all big last night, but where are you now? Who was it who said he was Abimelech and why should he be our king? The men you ta taunted and cursed are right outside the city. Go on, go out and fight. And again, that kind of middle school cafeteria or gym class, fight, fight, fight. This, the idea of this crowd pushing people to violence that they've been talking about but haven't been acting on. That demand 
that pa- the demand that power is all or nothing and that's determined by physical violence. That's another stone of patriarchy. Well, the fighting is terrible up to the very gates of the city. Gaul's men are killed and injured. In the second day of battle, Gaul is again betrayed. Another person, we don't know who it is, reveals his battlefield strategy to Abimelech. Again, a stone in the path towards justice and peace as someone within Gaul's own camp allies themselves with a likely victor to win favor with their future overlord. And how often do we do the same? White women in particular, we do this. We choose to curry favor with patriarchy, hoping it will protect us rather than choosing solidarity with its victims. Abimelech captures the city of Shechem where Gaul is fomenting riot. He kills everyone in it and levels it. But why? Why not just rule over it? Again, a stone of patriarchy. Threats to the patriarchy must be annihilated. The rural people of the area understand that they're in danger and they flee to an area fort. When Abimelech meet, reaches Mount Zalman, he instructs his men to bring bundles of firewood to the base of the fortress. They set the whole thing ablaze, killing the refugees, seeking sanctuary inside. And another stone here, the way that patriarchy kills the innocent. It claims to protect women and children. But it's a we know that again in the contemporary time that murder by intimate partner is the leading cause of death among pregnant and postpartum women in the U.S. Abimelech's men march on to the city of Thebes, and again the people have fled to the fortress inside the city. They have gathered on the roof to watch the battle and perhaps to put themselves as far from danger as they can go if the fortress is breached. What a decision to climb to the top so that perhaps you can be the last to die. This is another stone of patriarchy, forcing the most vulnerable to fight against each other for limited safety. Well, the people there, they see Abimelech's men gathering wood once more. Surely they have heard about the massacre at Mount Zalman. Perhaps they can even smell the smoke from it. They can smell the, the smoke from the deaths of other innocent victims to this feud that they can't even understand. More stones here, community-wide trauma, militarism, environmental devastation. And we see the consequences of these today in Myanmar, in Afghanistan, in Palestine, in Honduras, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And again, it's not that women can't wage war or that men can't resist it, but in general, the more patriarchal a culture is, the more warfaring it is. All forms of violence are connected, including war and patriarchy. Well, Abimelech approaches. He shows his men again how to burn the place down for no reason except his bruised ego, for no reason except to stop the potential threat, the potential spread of a threat against him. You might think of it as he's afraid of the domino effect, right? If one person was threatening him, who else might be? Two towns ago, there was a drunken man rousing anger at Abimelech's rule, and now Abimelech is on his way to burn down a third town, level it, and kill all the people. They have no idea why. They have nothing to do with this. And this is where our story, I think, takes this sudden turn, which makes, to me, this story stick out um, compared to some other stories of the Hebrew Bible. From above, a woman unceremoniously settles the issue. She drops a millstone in Abimelech and kills him. We don't know her name. Almost kills him. We don't know her name, and we don't really know her strategy, but it seems to me an act of superhuman strength, like a mother picking up a car that's trapped her child underneath and tossing it aside. There's a depiction of, of this scene by the artist Kevin Raleigh, and he shows her pregnant, and I can believe it because pregnant people are amazingly strong. I imagine that she scans the group below, she identifies the leader, and she accurately hurls the stone as an act of last hope. It's this or they die. And in fact, if she misses, they probably die in a more gruesome way because patriarchy does not tolerate self-defense. It is literally, in Abimelech's case, a scorched and then salted earth orientation to conflict. And she doesn't kill him, she injures him and he recognizes he's going to die. He calls for his sword bearer to kill him. 
draw your sword and kill me. So they can't say a woman killed him. So a servant runs him through and he dies. What's worse than death? Being killed by a woman. And look at what his men do. The scripture tells us when the Israelites saw Abimelech was dead, they went home. They were never motivated by principle. They weren't really loyal to him. There is no value to them in their actions. They wanted a strong man. And when he disappeared, they disappeared too. Perhaps I wonder, do they look at each other kind of sheepishly thinking, what are we doing here? Murdering women and children? Chasing innocent people into a tower to set them on fire? Maybe they look at each other and they recognize that they have secrets to keep all the murders at Shechem and Mount Zalman. How has their infliction of violence and destruction bonded them together? And what moral injuries might they be starting to recognize? How have they harmed themselves, demeaned and debased themselves and injured themselves by participating in this? How will they explain to, what other, to other people what they've done? Or maybe do they just shrug and walk home, explain to themselves that it wasn't their fault, they were led astray? Or do they convince themselves that they were just patriots? We don't know, but the text tells us something important here at the end, this unsatisfying lesson about patriarchy. It says, thus God repaid the wickedness that Abimelech had done to his father by murdering his 70 brothers. Abimelech's initial crime was murdering his brothers. And who was wronged by that? The scripture says his father. That's because children, even men, were seen as properties uh, of their father. And men in particular were going to be the inheritors of their father's uh, wealth and prestige. How is Gideon going to live on? He was going to live on through his sons. And now he's been robbed of that. He nearly ends the line of Gideon. What's a fair exchange for snuffing out or almost snuffing out an entire family line? and the family line of a hero of the faith. What if you've done that? Is the, is the punishment you deserve? And the scripture says it's death at a hand of a woman. Thus God repaid the wickedness. How did God repay the wickedness? By allowing a woman to kill him. Her power here is tenuous. If she drops the stone and she misses the king, she's going to be killed for daring to raise her hand at all. This is another stone of patriarchy. Patriarchy turns women who exert their power into threats rather than leaders. Seventy men's murders are avenged by a lethal injury by a single woman to one powerful man. Think about what that tells us about how men's lives are valued under patriarchy, that they're so easily wiped out by a woman exerting power. This is another stone that patriarchy kills men whose lives are devalued and degraded by it. And we see this in our culture too, as men make many dangerous choices to defend themselves against appearing womanly. It kills men every day, as any ER nurse can tell you. And it's a major reason why more boys, uh, fewer boys make it to adulthood than girls. In fact, in the US, more boys are born than girls, but by uh, the end of adolescence, we have more girls than boys primarily because of, or, or significantly because of childhood accidents. Uh, accidents that we permit to happen because we encourage boys to take risks. Well, this is another stone. Patriarchy is so fragile. That fragility means it has to be heavily defended, heavily policed, narrowly defined, and highly exclusive. It means that men as well as women are sacrificed to it. Those 70 men, why did they die? We look at the harm and there's no math that makes this make sense. Not just the 70 brothers, but the hundreds, perhaps thousands of men, women and children dead, all in defense of Abimelech's effort to seize and defend his power. One woman is as powerful as the 70 men here, but only when her power is against a strong man. Abimelech's youngest brother give, delivers this prophecy earlier in the chapter, which and we didn't read that part. But the prophecy comes true. He says, you've chosen a bramble king and Abimelech is a bramble king. He's not a, a mighty 
cedar is not a beautiful olive tree. He's a leader who's a danger to those he should serve. In the end, he destroys everything he touches, including those who enabled him. And that's the reality of patriarchy. It's a stone around our culture's neck and it burdens us and sometimes it kills some of us. We've heard in today's worship service some other references to stones. I know you caught one in Frost's poem, right? Stones like loaves, stones so round they can barely fit them together. In Mending Wall, we see two neighbors working together as they fix a mutual fence that they understand very differently. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, or is the one who notes there's no need for this boundary, right? There's no cows. My apples aren't going to eat your pine. The other steadily repeats his objections. Good fences make good neighbors. I don't know if you caught the other allusion to stones today. It's in the first line of the third verse of the opening hymn, Come Thou Fount. And the, the lyric says, Here I raise my Ebenezer. Here by thy, help I, thy great help I've come. And Ebenezer is a great stone, a memorial marker. I wonder if, if in this um, final scene, do they find that millstone and turn it into a marker? Is it a memorial to the woman who did this thing and saved their town? Well, the stones of patriarchy are heavy. We struggle to move them, long lasting, and it often takes centuries of wind and sand and water to change them. But they are movable. Like our words, like a mended wall that protects us, but also excludes some of us. Stones can help or harm. And all stones can be repurposed toward good. We can murder our brothers on a stone or we can thresh on it. We can launch an attack from a fortress or seek safety in it. And the same stone that can be a weapon can be a millstone. That same millstone that crushes someone could feed a community. My prayer for us is that we take back the stones of patriarchy, that we dismantle those mounds that have crushed us, and that we use our millstones to meet the needs of our world this week. Amen.